South. Where do people speak the second worst English in America? New York City, New Jersey, and so forth, right? Where do people speak the best English in America, according to people from Southeastern Michigan? Right. Southeastern Michigan, right? <laughs> so, in fact, the top three things of salience don't have anything to do with dialect differences. It has to do with where do people talk good and where do people talk bad. So, let's just cut to the chase we said and ask people on a scale of 1 to 10, just a straight old folk linguistic question, where do people talk the best English in the United States? And here's the answer from southeastern Michigan. On a scale of 1 to 10, Michigan and only Michigan scores in the 8-point range. Now you can see that a trip from Michigan to Alabama is a disaster. <laughs> you go from 8, you don't even go from 8 to 7, you go from 8 to 6, so they know something about Indiana. Then Kentucky is a five, then Tennessee is a four, and Alabama's way down to the three. Now, some of you who have done social science work will understand that when you give rating scales to people, they like to huddle around the middle, not these guys from Michigan. They know that Alabama is a three, and they know that they're an eight. And in fact, to say that it's in the eight range is kind of stupid because it was at the top of the eight range. It was almost a nine. In fact, Appalachian immigrants and African Americans in Michigan gave an average score of nine to Michigan. So they, they bought into the Michigan myth that we're good talkers right away. So what we discover here is that when people draw maps, they give us the folk linguistic information not about where people speak differently, but about one of the most important concerns in folk linguistics, namely good English and bad English. But I swear to you that this is not limited to English. That if you go to Spanish-speaking cultures, you will find, for example, uh, and my former student, Gabriel Alfaras, has done this with Cuban respondents, and finds, for example, that in the Dominican Republic, you will find absolutely the worst Spanish you can find anywhere in the world. Uh, on the other hand, outside of Spain, uh, that we will find the very best Spanish uh, in Colombia. She's recently replicated this study, and she's found that Argentina has dropped in the rankings. I don't know what happened in Argentina. Maybe Maradona stopped playing football or something, but they really dropped. <laughs> So let's look now into the B prime. Suppose somebody does something, suppose it's somebody like me, and I say, could I borrow a pin off of you? A pin? Does anybody have a pin? <laughs> now I mean a P-E-N, right? <laughs> so you're sitting out there and say, hmm, who are them guys who are so stupid that they can't tell the difference between a P-E-N and a P-I-N? Oh, I know they're Southerners. Whoosh, off you go to B prime. Southerners, hmm. Let's see, those are the guys that marry their cousins, don't wear shoes till they're 32, make moonshine liquor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? <clears throat> and they're not very smart. So then all of the stuff about not distinguishing between PIN and, <clears throat> however in the hell you all say it, P-E-N, it gets imbued with all of these ideas about, you know, drinking corn liquor and not wearing shoes and marrying your cousin and so forth. Now, for example, when I tell people in the North that us guys who do this stuff, right, distinguish between horse and horse, which none of you can do. Because you think that, you, when you say that your quadruped has a bad throat, you say your horse is a little horse. <laughs> Big deal, I know your horse is a little horse, but how about your horse being a little horse? <laughs> I got all, and oh, I got two different vowels before R. Probably ain't nobody else in this, oh no, who's from, who's from Louisville? Somebody else from Louisville, but, but kind of young, so might not have it anymore. So here down here is what something happened. So I did this pin-pin business, and you said, oh, I know this, this is Southerners. So now I've got to go down and find out what is it about Southerners that I know. Well, everybody knows that people from the South are, are, are red, racially prejudiced. They know they have a poor education. On the other hand, notice there's another side to Southerners, right? Southern hospitality and so forth, so they're friendly and sympathetic. On the other hand, this racial prejudice, poor education, that's tied to violence, right? And over here, though, there's a kind of genuineness. Yeah, there's no... There's no fancy pants, funny business going on in the South, and genuineness, oddly, is tied to honesty, and that friendliness leads to sympathy, and so over here you have racial prejudice on one hand and support for civil liberties on the other, and that's what your brain looks like. Your brain is full of contradictions. This is a picture of the inside of your brain. How can Southerners be, you know, rude, violent, and be whacking people and turning dogs on them at the one hand, and the other time be, you know, sympathetic and be so open, so hospitable? So there's something funny, there's contradictoriness in your brain, and your brain doesn't like contradictoriness, so at one time it's probably going to go for only one of these pieces of information. It's not going to put contradictions together, because when you're being a real person, you don't say things like, 
Well, on the one hand, I believe this, but it's also <laughs> the fact that I believe in no. When you're a real person, you don't do this. You only only professors and crazy people talk like that, right? Real people say, eh, damn southerner, prejudice, all hell is dumb, make moonshine, all that stuff. Or you say, you've had some experience. You say, oh yeah, those guys, man, they're really friendly. I mean, you go down there, you know, they, they give you the shirt off their backs and all that kind of stuff, right? So this is, this is what your brain looks like only in part.